Good morning, everyone. I'm Dana Corson, a media officer with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Thank you for joining us this morning for a webinar on the report that was just released titled Getting to Zero Alcohol Impaired Driving Fatalities, a Comprehensive Approach to a Persistent Problem. You may now download a copy of the report and other supporting materials at www.nationalacademies.org forward slash stop DWI deaths. And you can follow the conversation about the report on social media using the hashtag stop DWI deaths. For those of you not familiar with the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, we are private nonprofit institutions that provide independent objective analysis and advice to the U.S. to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions related to science, technology, and medicine. The National Academies operate under a congressional charter to the National Academy of Sciences that was signed by President Lincoln in 1863. For each requested study, panel members are chosen for their expertise and experience and serve pro bono to carry out the study's statement of task. The reports that result from the study represent the consensus view of the committee and must undergo external peer review before they are released, as did this report. I have with me today several members of the committee to discuss the report's findings and recommendations. But before I introduce the committee, I just want to go over a couple technical reminders. After the opening remarks, we will begin to take questions through the Q&A box located in the right, lower right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type your question in the box at any time and click Submit. We ask that you leave the box set to send your questions to all panelists and that you identify yourself and your organization when asking a question. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, please contact WebEx Technical Support. I'm going to give you their phone number. It's 1-866-229-3239. And now I'd like to introduce the members of the committee who are here with us today. Just a reminder, they're representing themselves and not their own institutions. Um, so first we have our the chair of our committee, Dr. Stephen M. Teutsch. He is senior fellow at the Leonard D. Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics at the University of Southern California, and adjunct professor in the Fielding School of Public Health at the University of California, Los Angeles. Next, we have Dr. Linda C. DeGudis, Executive Director of Defense Health Horizons, sponsored by the Henry M. Henry N. M. Jackson Foundation and adjunct professor in the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. Next, we have Dr. David H. Jernigan, associate professor in the Department of Health, Behavior, and Society at the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University. And last but not least, we have Dr. Tim Namey, physician at Boston Medical Center and associate professor of medicine at the School of Medicine at Boston University. We'll start off with a presentation summarizing the report by Dr. Teutsch, and then we'll open it up for any questions you may have. Please note that this webinar is scheduled to last one hour. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Teutsch. Thank you very much, Dana, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, before I begin, I'd like to introduce the members of the committee who you see here, um, all of whom represent uh, different areas of expertise in the field of relate, fields related to alcohol impaired driving. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, Academy staff who did incredible work over the last year to bring this uh, report to fruition, and that uh, uh, that study was led by Amy Geller, and uh, she was assisted with, by uh, Yami Nagusi, Amy Mead, Sophie Young, and Jennifer Cohen. The sponsor of the study was the National uh, uh, was NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and I want to express my thanks to to them as well. Uh, obviously, the study would not have taken place without their support, and they've been uh, at the cutting edge of highway traffic safety in this nation uh, for uh, for several decades. So, so thanks to them. 
I'm going to be running through these slides relatively quickly today, uh, but I wanted to let you know that the, they will be available uh, um, no later than the end of this week um, on the uh, um, uh, committee's website, um, as will the webinar itself. So we were charged by, uh, by NHTSA with looking at uh, ways to reduce alcohol-impaired driving uh, fatalities, and in particular the uh, interventions, which were include policies, systems, and programs uh, that were most promising to prevent injuries and deaths. We were asked to look at the barriers to action to implementing these and ways to overcome them, uh, and uh, the interventions that need to be changed or, or, or adopted. In keeping with the uh, National Academies Committee processes, we had a series of uh, public meetings where we uh, obtained expert input uh, from the public and many organizations. And then we had uh, five deliberative meetings among the committee members themselves and generated um, a, an eight-chapter report, which I'm going to be reviewing for you today. Uh, that report underwent extensive uh, external peer review uh, in accordance with the uh, Academy's uh, normal procedures. The approach we took uh, was a, uh, a public health or population health approach, uh, which means that we look at the data, we look at the contributing factors to these, uh, to these deaths, um, understand, understand the interventions that could be used uh, to, uh, um, uh, e to mitigate the problem, look at the uh, evidence behind those and the strength of, the, uh, of that evidence and how effective those interventions actually are. And then to look at uh, how that uh, uh, um, uh, problem can be monitored and progress monitored uh, going forward. We undertook a comprehensive literature re review to make sure that we uh, captured the uh, most promising and evidence-based interventions. Uh, and embraced Vision Zero as an underlying uh, philosophy. For those of you who may not be familiar with Vision Zero, this is a, an approach which has been adopted by many countries uh, around the world as well as many uh, cities uh, and states within the United States, uh, which really talks about uh, the path to getting to zero fatalities on, on, on the roads. Um, and it provides a unifying framework that allows us to look at changes in the social, economic, technology, and clinical arenas that prevent opportunities uh, to, uh, to mitigate these problems. Uh, it's a philosophy uh, that we hope uh, many stakeholders can embrace and, uh, and act on. The committee also had the benefit of uh, four background papers that it commissioned, as you see here on data, news media, the alcohol industry, as well as lessons from other countries. This is the conceptual framework that the uh, committee used. And I, I really want to start with the boxes that are uh, in the middle of this figure. Uh, and it begins with uh, understanding the problem of alcohol consumption and as it leads to drinking to, comp to, uh, to uh, impairment. The next step in the process is um, that uh, many of those people then drive while they're impaired. Many of those people then, or at least some of those people, end up in motor vehicle crashes, and so they and others suffer serious injuries and fatalities. So we looked particularly at those steps uh, on drinking to impairment, driving impaired, and what happens after crashes as a way to organize our thinking and the interventions uh, that can be brought to bear. The box at the top of this figure represents the range of intervention opportunities that, uh, that we examined. Uh, they included uh, the enforcement environment, the physical environment, behavior change uh, interventions, uh, clinical management, the development of new technologies, the alcohol environment, sociocultural environment, and so forth. The committee recognized that uh, all of these things exist within a broad social, economic, political, legal, and physical context. So we tried to interpret what we, our findings in the light of uh, the individual circumstances that exist in different communities. To orient you to the uh, to the publication itself, which um, we know is a long document. Um, I wanted to at least review for you where you can find the different components. Chapters one and two provide the, the introductory information about the problem of alcohol-related driving as well as the current alcohol and driving environments. Chapters three to five review the actual 
uh, um, interventions that one can bring to bear. And they were organized in the way that I just described about drinking to impairment, driving while impaired, and then the post-crash events. The sixth chapter um, talks about the information that's available, the data and surveillance systems uh, that contribute to our understanding of the problem. And then seven, chapter seven and eight are really a call to action and describe the social movements and community actions that are necessary so that we begin to make significant inroads into, into uh, this problem. So what is the problem? <clears throat> well, um, as you can see from this figure, the, uh, there was significant progress made in alcohol impairment drive, impaired driving fatalities um, was, uh, beginning in the 1980s, uh, spearheaded largely by, by MAD. Um, but that progress has waned, and the last few years has seen the, the, that the number of deaths has not only failed to de go down further, but has in fact increased. And we have over 10,000 deaths on our road attributed to alcohol impairment every year. Um, and uh, we feel that the uh, more needs to be done to be re to uh, renew the progress that was being made earlier. And obviously, it's not just the driver that is uh, that is uh, um, uh, affected by these. About forty percent of the deaths occur among someone other than the alcohol impaired driver. And if you think about that, um, by comparison, uh, only about 8.5% of smoking-related deaths occur to, due to secondhand smoke. So a far larger proportion of the deaths in, uh, related to uh, alcohol-impaired driving fatalities are actually do uh, occur among uh, someone uh, who is a secondary victim of the, of the problem. These uh, events take an enormous toll on society. In, in 2010, an estimate of the medical, legal, and property damage costs associated with alcohol-impaired driving came to over $120 billion. So it takes a big chunk of societal resources to deal with this problem. <clears throat> Internationally, uh, the United States uh, comes out poorly as well. And here you can see the uh, uh, number of traffic deaths per million population. Uh, the United States um, has by far the highest number of such deaths. Follow, and you see here the, uh, the rates in many of the other developed nations. Even if we were to adjust this, for the number of vehicle miles traveled, the United States uh, would still have the greatest number of, of deaths. And I think that one of the t important takeaways from, from this graph is that other countries have found ways to reduce this problem, uh, not to eliminate it, but to get it down to much lower levels. So we have a lot of work to do in this country, and uh, clearly uh, that can be accomplished, as you see that these other nations uh, have managed. So who's affected? Um, well, young drivers, uh, particularly those aged 21 to 25, are disproportionately involved in these uh, uh, fatal crashes. They actually account for a, over a quarter of motor vehicle crashes where the driver had a BAC, blood alcohol content, equal to or greater than 0.08%, the current uh, 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 per se limit in, in all, of, all of our states. The other uh, uh, major area I wanted to call your attention to is, is the problem in rural areas. Um, almost 50% of these deaths actually occur in rural areas and far out of proportion to the number of people who live there. Uh, the committee looked briefly at uh, alcohol consumption trends in the country, which you, which you see here. Um, and then you can see in recent years, the actual consumption of, uh, of alcohol per capita has been increasing. Binge drinking is uh, strongly associated with alcohol impaired driving. Indeed, about 85% of all alcohol impaired, dress, uh, uh, alcohol impaired driving episodes occur among those who have been 
binge drinking. Um, and, and, you know, over 90% of the people who actually binge drink do not actually have uh, um, alcohol use disorders. Uh, but it's important to note that the kind of interventions that we are talking about here that uh, are, uh, um, uh, are intended to reduce uh, uh, this problem and per binge drinking in particular are also protective against alcohol impaired driving uh, more generally. And what we uh, are going to be talking about is a comprehensive set of effective interventions and strategies uh, that can be done to ameliorate the problem. So uh, a little bit about um, alcohol um, and uh, people's ability to uh, assess their level of impairment. Uh, what you see in the figure are what is considered a standard drink, which is uh, 12 fluid ounces of 5% uh, beer, um, uh, 5 ounces of typical 12% uh, uh, wine, uh, or 1.5 uh, ounces of spirits. But the amount of uh, 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 the effect of these of these drinks is is hard to infer because individuals differ in their uh, their weight, their sex, their ability to metabolize uh, the um, uh, the alcohol. And in fact, the serving sizes, which I show here, are actually while well, uh, what we call standard, are uh, often often differ substantially from what people are actually served. Uh, alcohol beverages tend to have more alcohol than this. Serving sizes are frequently larger than shown here. People occasionally drink these in combination with energy drinks, all of which make it very difficult for individuals to understand the level of impairment they actually have at any given uh, given time. So what we have is a, a complex pro problem, a public health problem, that really requires a, a, a multi-sector, multi-component approach if we're going to begin to make significant inroads. So I'd like to turn now to the committee recommendations, which are organized in the way that I suggested earlier in terms of uh, uh, drinking to impairment, driving while impaired, and the uh, post-crash events. So let me start with uh, alcohol taxes. Um, the graph on the right shows the inflation-adjusted um, uh, alcohol uh, excise taxes among U.S. states. And the message here is that, in fact, those taxes have been going down steadily for many years. They're about a third lower than they were uh, in 1991 in inflation-adjusted terms. Approximately five cents, uh, uh, our state taxes are about five cents per drink. The federal taxes um, are also roughly five cents uh, per drink, so a total of 10 cents per, uh, per drink. Um, there is substantial evidence that higher alcohol taxes reduce alcohol-impaired driving and, and their uh, uh, concomitant fatalities. But the 10 cents that we're talking about here is substantially less than the cost that those uh, that, that alcohol consumption actually induces in terms of healthcare productivity, criminal justice, and and uh, so forth. The actual costs that are uh, induced are closer to two dollars per drink, of which maybe 40 percent, 30 to 40 percent, accrues to government at the state and local level, as well as and, and federal levels. So our report recommends that federal and state governments should increase alcohol taxes significantly. As I'm sure most of you are aware, the uh, uh, federal taxes were recently reduced, so it uh, becomes more important for state governments to take uh, effective action. And when we talk about s significantly, we think they need to make significant inroads into that two dollars of external costs that these alcohol uh, um, uh, that alcohol induces. There are a number of other things that uh, uh, that can be done at the state and local level to uh, limit or reduce alcohol um, availability, including restrictions on the number of uh, um, uh, alcohol outlets, as well as limiting the days and hours of alcohol sales. One of the um, other um, problems that we see, and it's particularly important for uh, uh, the uh, are, are to uh, uh, stop illegal sales, which means uh, sales to already intoxicated individuals, as well as uh, underage persons. Uh, there are laws, of course, about this in uh, in most jurisdictions, but they need to be strengthened and enforced, and uh, and uh, 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 we need to dedicate real enforcement resources to assuring uh, that uh, that these problems are uh, are, are addressed. <laughs> 
federal, state, and local governments also need to use their regulatory powers to uh, address the problem of uh, um, uh, uh, of marketing. As, as most of you are undoubtedly aware, young people are not only at higher risk of alcohol-impaired driving, but they're also uh, influenced to a greater extent by alcohol mar uh, marketing. The alcohol industry does have self-regulation of its marketing, but uh, the committee found that it was neither effective nor sufficient. The uh, standards are actually pretty vague. They're permissive. They're not consistently followed. And even when they are violated, they're, they, they're no, really no uh, attached penalties. So we think that uh, the, uh, this provides a basis for the governments to strengthen and implement sta standards for permissible alcohol marketing content and placement, uh, establish real consequences for violating those, and as well as to promote uh, and fund counter-marketing uh, campaigns. Well-funded media campaigns can make a difference, uh, but we th the committee found that there are two important components that need to be uh, incorporated. First, they need, these campaigns need to be uh, guided by rigorous research and what we know about behavior change theories to inform their design and dissemination. And equally importantly, they need to be linked to uh, alcohol-impaired driving enforcement policy interventions, such as uh, uh, blood alcohol content, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, sobriety checkpoints, and other types of interventions. Because the goal here is actually to begin to uh, create not only a deterrence effect, but also to uh, begin to change the uh, social acceptability of, uh, of drinking to impairment. Which brings me to blood alcohol uh, content and BAC laws. Uh, the committee believes that the, they should be lowered to 0.05 percent. They've been the BAC laws have been uh, important historically to reducing alcohol-impaired driving fatalities. And, and we know that uh, the ability to operate a vehicle deteriorates significantly at 0.05 percent, but also begins at levels actually lower than 0.05 percent. Most developed countries have already adopted a 0.05 BAC laws, and those were effective in reducing um, uh, alcohol-impaired driving uh, crashes really at, uh, at all levels of BAC. Indeed, about uh, actually about uh, 2 billion people now live uh, in areas where uh, um, 0.05 BAC laws are, are in place. So, our recommendation is that state governments should enact per se laws uh, at this level uh, for alcohol impaired driving. And uh, as we found with reducing uh, the um, BAC laws from uh, 0.1 to 0.08, uh, the federal government often needs to take a action and incentivize the change. Um, and we're going to need stakeholders to engage in this process to develop the, uh, the support for this kind of action. The enactment of these laws uh, should be accompanied by media campaigns and other visible enforcement efforts, again, to begin to change the uh, social acceptability of, uh, of drinking to impairment and certainly to these levels. States um, and localities should also conduct uh, frequent sobriety checkpoints um, in, in association with widespread publicity to promote the, the awareness of, of these uh, initiatives. Uh, and uh, these are uh, held today in, uh, in many states, but they're quite variable in their uh, uh, intensity and in how they're done. So we need very greater uh, uh, information about how they can be done in a way that is most effective, most systematically, uh, and and uh, at the uh, at, at in places where they're likely to be most effective. The committee also discussed uh, DADS, the uh, Driver Alcohol Detection System for Safety. And for those of you who are not aware of of, of this, uh, this is a uh, a system currently under development, which um, it, it provides a passive way to detect whether the driver has uh, uh, a the driver's alcohol level, and then if they exceed that level, uh, to prevent the uh, uh, the car from starting. Um, as that tech, the committee found that uh, this was a very promising technology, and as it uh, is perfected, uh, we think that uh, auto insurers can incent its use through policy discounts, uh, 
Uh, and later, once the cost uh, is sort of commensurate with other uh, comparable safety devices, uh, we think that this should make DADS uh, mandatory in uh, in all new new vehicles. So we look forward to the uh, uh, further development and perfection of the technology so that it, uh, we can get it into into vehicles. One of the problems, of course, is that impaired drivers need to, uh, not impaired drivers, people who drive to impairment need to find uh, ways to get uh, get home or to where, to their destinations. Uh, and we think that municipalities can take uh, important action to increase the availability, convenience, affordability, and safety of transportation alternatives, including ride sharing, um, enhancing public transportation options, particularly uh, at high risk periods uh, at night and on weekends, and uh, boosting and uh, incentivizing transportation alternatives in, in rural areas. Uh, this is a, clearly a, an area which uh, is uh, in dire need of some, uh, uh, some new innovation. So turning to post-crash e events, uh, the, the next recommendation relates to uh, DWI courts, um, which are courts that are meant to in, uh, integrate um, uh, the clinical management of people to make sure that uh, people uh, who have uh, alcohol use disorders and uh, related conditions are evaluated by a trained clinician and get the kind of care they, they need to reduce recidivism. Uh, every state really needs to have a set of these courts uh, so that uh, uh, we can begin to deal with the uh, the problem in the heavy drinker, but um, as as I noted earlier, of course, uh, most uh, most uh, fatalities uh, occur among those who actually don't have an alcohol use disorder. So uh, these are an important adjunct, but not a magic bullet by themselves. Um, all healthcare systems also need to provide the kind of care that uh, will reduce this problem, including um, a systematic screening, brief intervention, and referral to therapy in uh, in primary care and emergency room uh, systems. Uh, they need to have the kind of care available for those who uh, who need it in terms of uh, uh, alcohol use disorders, which include cognitive behavior therapies and uh, effective medication assisted therapies. Uh, many of you have probably heard of uh, ignition interlocks, which are devices that require somebody uh, who has them installed, and this is for uh, people who are who've, who've, uh, um, have had an alcohol-related uh, driving offense, uh, to breathe into a breath alkalizer, which is connected to the uh, ignition system, so that if uh, when they uh, breathe into that uh, system, uh, that uh, if they exceed a certain level of uh, alcohol, that the car won't start. About 30 states uh, have such uh, laws in place now, uh, but they're used quite variably uh, among in, uh, offenders. And while they're they're very very effective, they're uh, obviously not effective uh, if you don't have them installed at all, or if they uh, uh, are, are are removed from a from a vehicle. So we recommended that ex all offenders uh, actually have ignition interlocks uh, installed, uh, and states every state should uh, enact an all-offender ignition interlock uh, system to reduce these uh, um, uh, fatalities. Uh, the the monitoring periods, as I indicated, vary substantially among states. Um, we feel that uh, that uh, since there is good evidence that they they're uh, effective almost exclusively while they're installed, those periods need to be extended, uh, perhaps up to two years for uh, the first offender and uh, up to four years for people who have uh, 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 you know, multiple offenses. I'm going to skip the sec, uh, uh, all the detail here, but the committee re extensively reviewed the information needs that are required to understand this problem more fully, monitor progress, and begin to uh, uh, understand uh, uh, you know the changing nature of this problem. So there are many gaps in our uh, in our data systems. Uh, they're not standardized, and frequently the data aren't collected. Uh, and you know even basic things such as uh, the place of last drink is generally not available, uh, which hinders enforcement. Uh, 
So we, uh, 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 we recommend that NHTSA convene a group of stakeholders basically to uh, first uh, build that database and then to communicate that information uh, um, uh, in, a, in a more effective way, first by creating a metrics dashboard so one can see up-to-date information about where we stand on the most important uh, variables, and then to uh, publish brief uh, quarterly and annual reports that uh, um, um, really portray this problem uh, so it doesn't uh, uh, continue to fall off the, uh, the radar screen. Clearly, there's a need not only to talk about these problems, but to do something about it. Um, and one of the most important uh, stakeholders here, obviously, is the alcohol uh, industry, by which we mean both the, uh, all of the producers, the wholesalers and distributors, as well as the retail outlets. Um, and, uh, you know, they can contribute in, in, uh, in many ways, including uh, reducing the alcohol content of existing products by refraining from marketing, uh, uh, in, including sponsorships that are likely to influence excessive alcohol use. Um, and most importantly, uh, by supporting many of the measures that we talk about in, uh, in this, in this uh, report uh, that are highly effective in uh, uh, um, reducing alcohol-impaired driving. Uh, many of the things that uh, that, they, uh, that uh, they're currently involved with um, uh, have not been shown to be terribly effective, uh, so we'd like to see them to step up and be uh, uh, um, more helpful in making sure that, uh, that we uh, address this problem with effective interventions. The National Conference of State Legislators, uh, Legislatures um, should draft model legislation to provide benchmarks for states. Um, obviously, this is a complex area. The laws are quite variable across states. And if, we, if the uh, NCSL could create a, uh, a set of uh, best practices that states could use and then adapt, uh, it, could make, it could help uh, facilitate uh, the uh, um, uh, implementation of uh, of uh, uh, more effective state state laws. NHTSA itself can uh, also create a federal interagency coordinating committee to develop a comprehensive and integrated strategy uh, and ensure better collaboration among uh, the federal agencies um, and uh, begin to uh, share information and monitor progress and help uh, uh, maintain accountability across all of these important uh, federal stakeholders. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a need also to provide better training, technical assistance, uh, and uh, uh, more demonstration project, uh, projects uh, regarding the implementation of effective strategies. Uh, here's a role that NHTSA federal partners and private sor uh, sources can, uh, can undertake uh, to support those activities to make sure that uh, the knowledge and information gets out there where they can do the most good to drive the changes in the uh, state and local communities. At the end of the report, you'll find a, uh, a table, uh, which I hopefully will, I, which, which we think would be helpful uh, uh, to bring a lot of this together. It relates the different stages of um, uh, of these interventions. It describes what they are, uh, what the level of evidence is that supports them, who can take the lead, which stakeholders um, uh, uh, should be involved, and it also describes the time frame in which uh, one might be able to expect to see changes. And what we'll see is that uh, there are an enormous number of stakeholders from enforcement, the healthcare system, the industry, uh, the, uh, the victims and their families, uh, and many others uh, that all have important roles to play to make sure that uh, we make progress in solving this problem. And with that, I'll end and uh, look forward to taking uh, questions. And again, thank you uh, for, for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Teutsch. Um, we will now move into our Q&A session. Um, I would like to start us off with um, your – I would like to start us off with a question. Your report says that deaths from alcohol-impaired driving are preventable. How is that possible given the multitude of factors that affect car crashes? So – we laid out uh, a, a comprehensive set of uh, interventions, and what we know is, of course, 
uh, injuries, these fatalities, are not accidents. They're reasons that they occur. And we can understand those and begin to intervene at them. You know, uh, you can ask, uh, well, what's the acceptable number of, uh, of deaths? And we would say the acceptable number is zero, just as it is for the airline industry. Um, and that what we need to do is galvanize action to begin to make progress, implement these recommendations, and begin to drive that number towards zero. Yeah, this is David. I would just add the whole Vision Zero concept really inspired us. Vision Zero looks at road traffic safety in general as a systems problem more than a problem of individual decisions, that there are problems with roads, with cars, et cetera, that make road traffic crashes more likely, and that if we address it as a systems problem, we have a much better chance of succeeding. So the committee's approach was to look at alcohol impaired driving in a very similar way. This is a systems problem. Let's look at all the ways we could intervene at the start in the decision to drink uh, excessively, then the decision to drive after drinking excessively, and then, of course, in the event of the crash and what happens after the crash, looking at all the systems that are engaged there, the committee really felt that we could make much more substantial progress. Thanks for that. Um, we're getting a couple questions, a few questions about, um, you know, kind of what's new in this report. A lot of the recommendations you put forth have been talked about a lot in the past. So, um, can you shed some light on that? Sure. I'll start and then turn over to my uh, my colleagues. Uh, and and the, the, you're right. Many of the recommendations that we made are not new, but they're also not being done. And part of the purpose of this report is to is to galvanize action um, and begin to not just talk about these things, but actually to do them. And there's some new opportunities uh, that we talked about. One, uh, as uh, David just mentioned, is systems thinking. One is to capitalize on better communication, social media, to animate stakeholders. And we're also on the cusp of many new technologies. And I, we mentioned a couple of them uh, here, the DADS, uh, more systematic use of ignition interlocks, and new technologies are coming down, down the road. So we have multiple opportunities, not only to capitalize on underutilized interventions, but capitalize on uh, uh, new momentum, communication, and technologies. Uh, Tim, did you, want, did you want to say something more? Sure, Steve. This is uh, this is Tim. I think one of the things that we are going to recommend that may get a lot of attention is um, changing the the legal limit for driving to to point oh five. Um, so that I think that's something that's for a lot of people in the United States, anyways, is new. Um, that's a highly uh, we think a highly effective intervention. It's not new in other countries, and I think as you mentioned in your talk, most people in the developed world live with point oh five laws or lower. Uh, so that's not new, but um, we think about 1,500 lives a year could be saved through that intervention. Of course, it hasn't been tried yet in the U.S. Utah has passed a .05 uh, law, but it hasn't been finalized yet. But we think that's a, something that's new for this country and is an exciting opportunity. And then, as you mentioned, a lot of the, the other things we're recommending are are old but haven't been done in a while. So, for example, raising federal alcohol taxes to keep up with even inflation hasn't been done since 1991. So that would be something new, <laughs> at least in one way of looking at it. Thank you for that. Um, next question is, if people cannot readily detect BACs of 0 .08, won't it be more difficult at 0 .05? What can be done to help people of supposedly good faith to be more accurate at this task? Do outlets offer any assistance such as even, quote, low-tech devices? Tim, do you want to address that? Yeah, so I think, listen, um, I think right now um, when we when we ask the, the average person who reports uh, that they've driven a car after having perhaps too much to drink, in quotes, um, they've consumed an average of, of eight drinks. 
So I think the point that's being raised is that there's concern that people who are drinking, you know, modest amounts of alcohol, they're worried about having a lower limit. I think the best advice for, we can't get into sort of the specifics of every scenario, but I think the, the best, you know, best advice is, you know, don't drink and drive. Um, and if you do drink alcohol and you're not sure that you, whether you might be impaired, the best thing is, is also not to drive. But I think in general for people drinking, you know, whether or not they're planning to drive or not, if they stick to sort of the within the guide, dietary guidelines recommendations of not having more than two drinks for a man or more than one drink for a woman, that's good general advice. But we won't get into more specifics than that. But I think, again, most people who are uh, drinking to impairment or in terms of getting into trouble with the law for, for driving are, are drinking quite excessively. Thank you. Next question. What marketing strategies have you found are influ influential in alcohol use or influence alcohol use? David, do you want to uh, comment on that? Sure. Um, I think the French have sort of led the way in banning the kinds of things that are most likely to be influential on young people. Um, young people are the population that has been most studied in terms of the influence of alcohol marketing. Given that 21 to 25 year olds are 28% of the drinking drivers, um, it's clear that we need to start young in terms of influence. Uh, and there are more than 25 longitudinal studies now that have found that the more that young people under 21 are exposed to alcohol marketing of various kinds, the more like they, likely they are to start drinking or if already drinking to progress from experimentation to binge or hazardous drinking. Now, the kinds of things that young people are drawn to in alcohol advertising, music, story, character, and humor. The bottom line is young people are not particularly interested in how long the beer, the alcohol was aged, what kinds of barrels uh, it was aged in, where the hops came from. Those kinds of product qualities um, aren't attractive to young people according to the research that's out there. And again, the French have banned all mention of lifestyle uh, while still permitting product qualities. Uh, so that provides one model going forward. The bottom line though for the US is um, given our strong protections for commercial speech, what's really needed is better protection from young people, for young people from seeing the alcohol ads at all. Uh, the industry has a self-regulatory standard, um, and we have. My center has been trying to report on how much they comply with that standard. Uh, and an earlier National Academies report recommend that they tighten the standard itself again to reduce the likelihood that young people will be exposed to alcohol marketing at all. Thank you, David. Next question, did the panel find any evidence that designated driver programs are effective at reducing alcohol-impaired driving at the population level? Sure. Linda, do you want to comment on that? Sure. Um, we did look at the question of designated driver programs to see if they are effective, and there really isn't good evidence to demonstrate that they're an effective strategy for reducing alcohol-impaired driving. So um, at this point, it's not something that we've included in our recommendations. Thank you, Linda. Next question. National fatality data indicates that the vast majority of drunk driving deaths are caused by drivers with BACs 0.15 and above. Why do you think a lower limit would be an effective measure to stop drivers who already drink far past 0.08 BAC? Tim? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, of course, if you're driving, the higher your BAC, the, the greater your risk, and that risk doesn't just go up in a straight line. It goes up in a, like a big exponential curve upward. So, so um, but the interesting thing about 0.05 laws is that uh, consistently in other developed countries when they've been introduced is that you see um, actually pretty similar reductions in crashes across all BAC levels, not just 
it's not necessarily just a surgical intervention where it only reduces or eliminates uh, crash deaths from 0.05 to 0.08, for example. You see that sort of reduction across the board because in general there's a greater awareness of the problem or a greater deterrence effect so that, you know, everybody who might be drinking and driving um, it sort of moves down a peg. So somebody who might have, you know, drank and then driven with a BAC of 0 .0, 0 0.15 might only do so at 0 0.10 or so on and so forth. So, again, we think that uh, 0.05 laws are effective across a range of BACs. And it's fair to say that there are more drivers out there at lower levels than at higher levels, and we know that that risk is a, of a, a crash definitely exists at uh, at 0.05. So uh, it's it's still a substantial number of people. We've gotten a few questions about the DADS, um, you know, potential future technology. Um, so can you expand on that? And wouldn't the availability of DADS make some of these, some of your other recommendations less needed? Well, I'll turn to my colleagues on on some of that, but I, I think it, it's fair to say that uh, it's going to be a few years till these technologies become available. I mean, the, the committee looked at a variety of technologies, uh, many of which um, provide um, uh, promising ways to actually address the true problem. You know, autonomous vehicles are many years in the future. Um, dads, hopefully many fewer. Um, someone asked about uh, uh, breath testing, personal breath testing uh, that one can do. There's technologies there that uh, are promising but haven't been fully evaluated. Um, so yes, uh, DADS uh, is a technology that we think um, uh, can uh, can can play a significant role. Meanwhile, though, until these technologies are out there, there are 10,000 people dying every year, and um, there are many things that can be done in the near term to uh, to reduce those deaths. Uh, so we're 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 both optimistic about the future of technology, but we're also trying to be realistic about the fact that. Uh, uh, you know, even if uh, we started putting them in our cars today, there would be many, many years until every car had such a device. So uh, we need to take a comprehensive approach, deal with the problem now, uh, while we uh, look towards uh, um, other solutions for the future. I don't know if my colleagues uh, wanted to say further, David. Yeah, just to add, I mean, the committee was very supportive of the DADS technology, but as Steve said, uh, it's not ready for prime time yet, and it's going to be a while before it is wide enough spread in terms of the total fleet of cars on the roadways uh, to be fully protective. But we did make a very specific recommendation about DADS that when it is uh, ready, uh, that insurance, uh, insurers uh, incentivize its adoption and uh, that when the cost is on par with other existing automos, automotive safety features and is demonstrated to be accurate and effective, that NHTSA mandate uh, dads in cars. But as Steve said, that is going to be a while, and in the meantime, there are ten thousands of lives to be saved. Thank you, David. Next question. The focus of your recommendations is alcohol. However, many other factors are contributing to impairment, such as marijuana, prescription drugs, drowsiness, etc. These are not mentioned. Is that because alcohol impaired driving is the predominant cause of crashes? So, a couple of things. Um, uh, the committee was very cognizant of uh, of the the complexity of these other problems, whether it's distracted driving or uh, um, uh, other substances. <clears throat> Our charge was to look at alcohol, and indeed, some of the things that you'll find in the report uh, do affect other forms of driving. But at the end of the day, um, the major problem is alcohol. Um, there are approximately uh, thirty percent of crashes fatal crashes today that are due to alcohol, and it's actually 50 percent of crashes are associated with at least some alcohol, even if it's, it doesn't achieve a BAC of 0 .08 among, the, uh, among the, any driver. If you compare that to um, distracted driving, which accounts for roughly 10 percent of deaths, or other types of substance use, which also accounts for roughly 10 percent of, of deaths, uh, alcohol is still 
the major one. And, um, you know, I think the committee is concerned uh, that um, with greater attention to some of these other issues, which deserve the attention, uh, alcohol may have uh, slipped a bit uh, in, in the public consciousness. Uh, and we need to renew that uh, activity because that is still the single greatest cause of uh, road fatalities. I don't, my colleagues have, uh, want to add to that? Okay, thank you, Steve. Next question. Um, have you considered the potential impact of self-driving cars? We did. Um, <laughs> one of you want to c comment on that? Linda, please. Um, we did consider that, but we think that the timing of that is a number of years off before they are widely available and, and certainly before the fleet overturns so that there is a, there is a large number of self-driving vehicles. Um, we do think that there is promise there, but we really need to do something now to stop these 10,000 plus deaths per year before self-driving cars are widely available. Thank you, Linda. Next question, could you talk a little bit about what you perceive to be the role of state and local public health agencies in helping to support these recommendations? Absolutely. Uh, we have one of the experts, former director of the Center for uh, Injury uh, at uh, the Center for Disease Control. Linda, do you want to comment on that? Sure. Um, well, first of all, this is a public health problem, and certainly with the number of deaths that are occurring every year, it is something that public health needs to be concerned about. And public health has the opportunity to participate in this initiative in many ways. One is to look at alcohol consumption, which is part of what public health does take a look at, and look at excessive consumption that contributes to alcohol-impaired driving and alcohol-impaired driving fatalities. And certainly some of the work that can be done by public health will not only help decrease these fatalities, but will also decrease some of the other um, health risks that are related to excessive alcohol consumption. So that is certainly one place. Another place is in the data systems and really identifying the kinds of things that contribute to somebody drinking excessively and then driving after drinking. Um, in addition, public health can help with identifying and promoting appropriate health messaging that will decrease the risk of someone drinking to excess and driving or even just drinking and driving. So public health has a number of roles that it can play um, in the interventions, in the prevention side, and also in interventions once someone is charged with impaired driving, looking at opportunities for treatment um, of alcohol use disorders, identification of alcohol use disorders even before treatment takes place, um, and really um, working through all the phases of this problem. Uh, so public health has a major role to play. Yeah, I'd, I would add that this is also uh, an area where there's been underinvestment, um, and uh, states are clearly in need of uh, additional resources. Uh, not the only area of, of need in, in terms of resources, but certainly one of them. Thank you for that. Next question um, is about personal breathalyzers. Um, there are personal breathalyzers that are priced reasonably, even keychain varieties. Do you support in some terms that discount incentives via insurance companies to purchase breathalyzers and, and to, attend, to attend a driving impairment course voluntarily could reduce driving accidents? So let me talk a little bit about breath analyzers, these personal breath analyzers, because the committee did uh, did did review them, uh, and this is another technology that the committee I think saw as promising, but it's still early days. The accuracy of these uh, devices uh, and their reliability um, needs to be firmly established, and then uh, the. We need better information about their actual use and how effective they are at uh, at uh, deterring alcohol impaired driving. Uh, just because something can detect something doesn't mean that people act on it, or even the right people 
<laughs> act on it. Often it's uh, the people who are uh, who care the most who are not likely to get into a vehicle who will do that anyway. Uh, so uh, we have a lot to learn about those kinds of technologies. We think that there's reason for um, optimism, uh, but we'd really like to see careful evaluations done uh, as they get into uh, broader use so that we can be uh, confident uh, about the level of effectiveness and uh, th and uh, uh, allow us to be uh, you know make clearer recommendations for the future. Okay, thank you. Next question um, is regarding the use of ride sharing um, applications. So how have they been shown or have they been shown to reduce have the use of um, ride sharing options like Uber and Lyft been shown to reduce alcohol impaired driving fatalities? And also, how can municipalities support policies and programs to get people home safely when they cannot support a public transportation system? Very good questions. Linda, do you want to tackle that? Um, sure, I can start. I think um, we did look at this issue of ride-sharing programs and are there options that would be beneficial to um, decrease alcohol-impaired driving. At this point, there hasn't been very much evaluation of these programs and we don't have strong evidence yet on whether these programs are effective in decreasing alcohol-impaired driving, but certainly um, the evidence is needed. I mean, we need to study this. We need to find out how they work and how they decrease alcohol impaired driving. Um, we do see opportunities, uh, we would say, and possibilities that these could be very effective, but we really need to have a look at the evidence. And it is something that certainly municipalities could support if they are effective. Um, they could support the options for allowing these kinds of programs to operate and really provide um, opportunities for people not to drive while impaired. And I think it's also fair to say that there are a, a variety of relatively small programs uh, that have been put in place that provide alternative driving in various communities. Some of them are supported by the hospitality industry, by uh, uh, ride sharing or uh, uh, taxi industry and others uh, that are, are not all paid for by government. Um, so that there, I think we do need to see um, um, how these things can be uh, implemented, but many of them are implemented at the very local level by people who are concerned about them, um, and uh, uh, you know, pr again, provide reason to think that there are options out there that uh, that could be developed. Thank you. We've got time for just a couple more questions. Um, next is um, I'm. The person says, I'm grateful your report indicates a strong link between alcohol taxes and reduced DWI. Can you discuss predictive modeling um, or other strategies legislators could, could utilize in their consideration of alcohol taxes? Yeah, Tim. Um, thanks for that question. Um, I, I'm not sure if we can discuss uh, predictive modeling, or maybe the idea is to you're getting at a sense of uh, sort of how effective our taxes, so we can sort of talk about that there's been sort of you know hundreds of studies on the relationship about how taxes lead to higher prices and how higher higher prices lead to decreased consumption. If, if in terms of talking about it to legislators, a sort of a um, about a 10% increase in price is typically related to about a 5% decrease in consumption and actually about the same size of decrease um, in terms of self-reported alcohol impaired driving and crash fatality. So it's a pretty good uh, relationship there, 10% increase and a 5% or so reduction. Those types of relationships are relatively similar to what you'd see with tobacco taxes, for example. So um, so I think that's sort of a way you can better sort of conceptualize the, the problem. 
And I think uh, if I understand the question correctly, one could do some simple modeling to basically say what would the impact likely be at a specific within a specific jurisdiction uh, if you knew the, the number of crashes, fatalities, and the uh, and the potential changes in uh, in alcohol taxes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and we're about to go to our last question. I, I recognize we've gotten a lot of other questions we haven't been able to get to, so apologies for that. Um, so our last question is, how should your recommendations be prioritized, and what are the next steps in ensuring that they are implemented? I'll take a first stab at that one. <clears throat> What we laid out was a suite of, uh, of recommendations. We did not prioritize them per se. We tried to give uh, uh, a, our best assessment of their, their likely impact. But we also realized when you've seen one jurisdiction, you've seen one jurisdiction. Um, they differ substantially in uh, uh, what their needs are, what the opportunities are, what's uh, feasible. And so we would l like to see that the stakeholders in each and every community um, band together, begin to move the agenda forward in ways that uh, are uh, appropriate for their uh, jurisdictions, obviously to uh, look at some of the uh, more effective interventions uh, as a priority, uh, but then to adapt them to their individual uh, states. So uh, it needs to be looked at holistically and develop a comprehensive set of interventions uh, uh, appropriate to each uh, state and locality. David, do you want to comment further? Well, and then it's critical to think about how these recommendations can actually be implemented. Uh, we look back in history to Mothers Against Drunk Driving and the incredible things that happened in the 1980s. It's perhaps not well known that MAD early on received seed funding from NHTSA. That kind of community level seed funding we think can help reignite a social movement uh, around these issues. We've had good experience with underage drinking, dedicated coalitions funded around the country, and we would like to see similar kinds of demonstration projects and funding provided at the community level to help people really tap into what is the basic set of American values here, that uh, our freedom to drive and to drive safely on our roadways, uh, also the incredible unfairness that I think people feel when someone who's not impaired uh, is injured uh, in an by an alcohol-impaired driver. Uh, the point is we want to create a system of roadways uh, and reignite a social movement uh, behind creating that system uh, that enables everybody uh, to use our roadways safely, um, that maximizes everybody's potential uh, to, and uh, really enables us to avert what we see as an unacceptable 10,000 deaths a year on America's roads. Thank you, David. And with that, we will end our Q&A session. So once you exit this webinar, you will be redirected to our report page, which is up on the slide right now, nationalacademies.org forward slash stop DWI deaths. The slides from today's webinar, as well as the recording of this webinar, will get posted on that page. And with that, I'd like to thank our speakers, and thank you all again for joining us today.